personnel, they're going to ask you, are they been trained? What knowledge do they have in the steps of the process that they're doing? You know, what's the post-harvest handling? What kind of training have you done in that? And your record keeping by all means. So be ready to answer these questions because, again, like Craig said, lots of times if you can just, if you have it down, you better be able to answer it. If you answer it fluidly and efficiently, then they'll say, okay, good. Otherwise, they'll say, come with me. Let's see what. So anyway, these points out here are just the pages in the, in the OPA's GACPs where this is referred to, but proper ID. We've already talked about that a lot. I cannot stress it enough with the current, for those of you who are not familiar in the industry, the New York Attorney General, how many of y'all saw that article about the New York Attorney General pulled some um, uh, store brand products off the shelves of, and they represented GNC, let's see, Walmart, Walgreens, Target. Target. He pulled them off the store, took them, and they did DA analysis, and I'll explain a little bit. They did some DNA analysis on it to supposedly test the ID, well, we found out that over 60, almost 70% of the material is extracts. DNA is great when we send the lab to Amanda over there and they can do it on a plant, just the whole material. But whenever you do an extract, not a lot of the DNA precipitates down through the extract process. So number one, his, uh, his testing was flawed. DNA on an extract is not even, and DNA is not a FDA approved identification process in and of itself for plant ID. So the headlines saying that none of these products had the botanicals in them that they were labeled for is completely wrong. In my opinion, it was a publicity stunt. So there's, a, there's been a lot of repercussions about that in the industry. But it has made a lot of companies go, well, maybe I do a little, do a little better job on plant ID. Which, so that part's always good. It's just bad when you throw something out in the New York Times and makes everybody look bad when it's not really legitimate science. Obviously, all of these things, environmental stewardship, Janine talked about legality. We'll touch on them a little bit as we go through. Identification, whether it's cultivated or harvested, you have to have some form of identification. That's required, okay, in the GACPs. And also, when we sell our products from a GACP point, <coughs> speaking of us as growers, raw material suppliers, to a company who's going to process it next, their GMPs require an ID, and they're going to come back to us and say, hey, where's your back? voucher specimen, where's your plant sample, where's your retention sample, where's your ID, just depends on the agreement you have with your buyer, but you've got to have some basis for proper plant identification. So here, you know which echinacea, echinacea species, yeah, I want to buy echinacea, which one? You've got to know exactly how to ID them and which one they are when your customer tells you. Don't mix them. No, don't mix them. In Passiflora, there's a lot of Passiflora products on the market now, and they say they're wildcrafted from Europe or South America when Passiflora incarnata may not be indigenous to that area. But Passiflora incarnata is if you look on most of the bottles, and that's the main thing. When it gets to the shelf, if it says Passiflora species, it can have a variety of species as long as they're proven to be safe. If it says Passiflora incarnata, it has to have only Passiflora incarnata. It not, cannot have other, any of the other 23 or more species that are native. So you just have, need to make sure. Golden seal, Hydrastis canadensis. If you don't know really what you're looking at, it could look a little bit like ginseng. But anybody that's in the plant business can tell the difference in these. Number one, when you sell it, you'll make a big difference in the, It's about a tenfold <laughs> price difference, too. So. But how do you do your plant ID? Again, do you start in the field? Fortunately, from our aspect, we can go out and collect a specimen. And just like Janine, we talked about, take paper in the field. Just press, take some samples back home with the tops. Where's the young lady that brought me the bag of material? There you are. She brought me some black cohosh in today. And she brought the tops with the roots. I was able to positively ID it. Positively. I bet my life on it is black cohosh. But you need to have both because hers was still fresh. Whenever they get washed, they get dried, they get cut up. The next stages, it's really hard to... So I do have sympathy for the manufacturers and the retailers. Not sympathy, but I understand their problem. Whenever they only receive a, a powder or a cut and sift form, they don't have a clue what it is. They depend on us to provide that proper identification. I want to make sure that we've done our due diligence in getting the material to them. For example, this. This is a uh, Sleepus tuberosa, pleurisy root growing in the field. If you cut it and took it in the dryer, you know, it could look like that, same, same colors, but it's really not. This is pleurisy root, this is California poppy. So again, you've just got to be careful. <clears throat> Quality assurance. 
The main thing I was going to focus on here, whatever you do, they must meet all specs and everything, but it still has to be in accordance with anything that's written, any agreements between the buyers and the sellers, because I may sell one crop to five different buyers, and they may have five different stipulations, five different requirements that I have to fulfill to supply to them. So you can do your best, but then again, talk to who you're going to sell to. They may have say, well, I need this. I don't care about this. Legal conformity, excuse me, like Janine said, both growers and wild, crab, wild harvesters must be aware of anything. Like Jean said, for example, in North Carolina, you have to have a permit to cultivate golden seal. To sell ginseng, I mean, to buy ginseng, you have to have a permit to buy ginseng. You just need to know all of these. Here we're going to talk a bit about good agricultural practice, specifically uh, collection. Again, identity, we've already talked about that. Can you know? That's not a very good picture to ask you to ID it from, but does anybody recognize that? Uh -huh. And know the botanical name? Nope. Milk thistle? Nope. And then again, there you're going for the, the bloom part, and then the seeds, and there it is in the bottle. So you just need to know. Another, this is another reason. Don't go to the internet for your ID. <laughs> <laughs> poison ivy, you may get this, because this will come up as a poison ivy. So don't use the internet for plant ID, okay, really. Like Janine said, there's some really good uh, books out here. The, uh, book by Stephen Foster and James Duke are really good line drawing ideas. So. Record keeping, I cannot stress that enough, and I believe Craig has, has adequately uh, shown us what that takes in the processes, and it does take time. Like Janine, I believe you said, farmers don't like to sit down and write things, they don't want to keep up with it, but we've got to do something in the winter. But anyway, <laughs> anything that you do, if you'll just take time to write it down at the end of the day, to me it's pretty much like a diary. You know, what did I do? Oh, I harvested today and I chopped it, washed it, and I dried it. Just a diary. Keep it down. Uh, again, for proper ID, this is the very uh, initial lease of uh, black cohosh. And if you're not careful, it can actually look somewhat like golden seal on this side when they're very young. They're very similar. The reason I showed you this picture, we, uh, uh, this is it in mature. This is about a three-year, about a four-year seedling bed. And then we transplant that from a seedling bed into a production bed. But the reason I showed you these pictures, they're a little hard to see too, but this is the same plant. But the, we, we uh, gave this lady some seeds. She put them out in her bed, mulched it. The next spring they came, kept coming up. She kept saying, man, I don't know, I keep waiting on the golden seal, but it's not coming up. But I'm weeding it every day. She was, these are the, initially, she was weeding these when actually they would develop in the golden seal. She had waited about two weeks. So she was weeding her golden seal. So, you know, know what you're weeding. Site analysis preparation, we've talked a little bit about that, where it is. If it's downhill from cattle runoff or something, you've got to be aware of that. Uh, your climatic conditions, your soil. This is really soil composition. The field history is very important. I'll tell you a short story about a grower of mine in Canada. Uh, he, got, he has his own farm. He needed some additional land. He leased land right down the road from him to buy some more, grow ginseng, certified organic ginseng on. It hadn't been farmed in uh, four to six years, I believe, it, from then. So he went, did his certification, his three-year turnover certification, grew ginseng on it, shipped it down to the U.S., came to the border, the FDA stopped it, inspected it, showed up with DDT residue, Agent Orange or DDT derivative. He said, but I haven't put anything on there. So he went back to the field history, went back to the previous owner. He had not applied anything for 17 years prior to that. But then they said, well, it doesn't matter. It's still got DDT residue. So here's the dilemma was, his product was rejected entry into the USA because of residuals, and the customer wouldn't have bought it anyway. But then he called me and said, well, what do I do about my organic certification? Do I lose my organic certification? So we called the certifier, called the authorities, and they talked back and forth. And the certifier said, no, you have not applied anything on there for three years. So even though your land shows it has DDT where you grew this, the product does, it's still certified organic. So I don't know what you do in that case. So anyway, previous exposures, just really pay attention to that. It, even some uh, these these chemicals, they say the half-life in the soil may be four, five, six years. I've seen them in the soil 30 years later. So sometimes they really don't know. It depends on what's happened in the soil previous to that. And your water source. We've already talked, we had a good conversation about water source, I believe. And there is a difference in irrigation water and then water used for post-harvest handling, washing things. So 
just need to pay attention to that. In monitoring, you said three times a year? Or uh, surface water. Surface water, okay. What about potable water? Potable Pot water once a year. Once a year, okay. So this is, a, this is a farm in California where we grow some echinacea purpurea. So this is irrigation water, and this is just how they surface irrigate out there. Uh, this is, pardon me? Is still doing it that way? Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, if they have water. That's a, I tell you, some of the farmers, the, it really is getting bad out there. And people, some of the farmers are selling their dry farm, and they're buying farmland simply based on water access. <clears throat> they're paying more for it. They said they have to. This is just a real quick study to show you how in depth you can get. We did a uh, worked with a customer who was looking for a specific constituent in echinacea purpurea, and we knew that uh, certain parts of the stage of the plant growth it was higher in some parts of the plant what they wanted. So anyway, it's called a. It's hard to read that. Sorry, but we set up an irrigation deficit study too because we can control the irrigation there, not like we can here by rain any day. We knew at certain stages of the plant we wanted to flush water to it to make it uptake water and then we want to pull the water back and sort of make it stress itself and that would increase the constituent. So we put monitors in the ground to monitor the depth of the water in the soil because we were using surface water and we knew the soil, we knew where the root mass was of the plant and we wanted it to absorb the, the water appropriately. So anyway, this is three different, we did an early irrigation, a normal irrigation, a late irrigation and by focusing on good agricultural practices we were able to increase the constituents in this plant. But this just shows the kilopascals, or is, is the pool on the molecules to absorb water. And it shows the late irrigation. We only irrigated three times that summer, and it really put the plants in undue stress. Anyway, we took nutritional data both before, uh, before irrigation and after irrigation. We compared those numbers, which really gave us some more background to go on. And then when we harvested the crop, we understood that we increased the Chicoric acid level, which is what this customer wanted, about 23%, simply by pulling back on how much water we are getting. So, in other words, there's a lot of agricultural practices that you can do to improve your plant. Yes, ma'am. Well, what support would we have to assure that we're producing this quality of a medicinal plant for buyers to be interested in? Most of the buyers, if it's under a cultivator or even anything, talk to them. I can tell you what time of season, what stage of plant growth to harvest most all the plants I buy for them to be at their optimum level. Post harvest handling is a whole different thing because you've seen, I've seen farmers grow a great crop, it looks good and everything and then they destroy it when they harvest it and dry it in the sun or they dry it too high or they let it degradate before they dry it. So really just talk to your buyer or the market you're going into and learn as much about it as you can. Okay. There's, there's no really good books. There's, you know, some of the high commodity products like milk thistle, like echinacea, like some of the others, but most of the time it's going to come on a one-to-one -one communication. Yes? You, you had, in this case, a buyer looking for a particular constituent right. for a particular purpose. Right. That another buyer would, in fact, reject the same product because... They wouldn't have rejected it, but they might not have paid it much. And also, the buyer, another thing they helped do is we harvested the plant every three weeks right. and sent it into the lab and they tested it and they said, oh, it's getting there, it's getting there, it's getting there. And then they said, hey, get it right now. So, right. you know, it's okay. And, yes, Jane. And Camille, I think one of the things that you were getting at <clears throat> is something that we've done research on a few plants about, like with golden seal, the level of shade that we used right. would affect the alkaloid level. So if you had, for example, a buyer that said, I'll pay you for higher levels of hydrostine in that, We've done a little bit of research to show you how to we manipulate it. There's a grower we both know up in Canada who's who's managed to tweak that. He knows if he does certain things, he can raise those levels and he's got certain buyers that'll pay him more for that, but others that won't. So he doesn't, you know, go to that extra measure on all. So it's again what your buyer wants right. that matters. And I'll show you some of the specifications from different buyers that I have a little later on, okay? But that's really that one-on-one -on -one communication. Questions? Ask them. Oh, let me go back there. Another thing that's really important here is your insect control. We talked about pest control. But what is your IPM, Integrated Pest Management Program? They want to see that. That's in the question and answer, too, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, no records, and records of all. Records of everything. Exactly, everything. You, this is uh, 
a golden seal grower in Wisconsin. <coughs> they do a really good job for us. They grow it, uh, they grow it in a seedling bed for three years and a production bed four years, so it's a seven-year crop. So a lot of these herbs take a long time. The majority of them are not annual crops. There are some annual medicinal herb crops, but a lot of them you've got to be able to be in it for a long time. I remember Janine, when we were going with the commercial uh, herbs for commerce project, you know, you go to some of these corn and soybean farmers and say, yeah, we want you to plant this, you harvest in three years. They're going, what? Three years? They can't even wait three years for some of these crops. So it's just a different train of thought. Um, Here's one of the good and the bad. This guy's, you know, he, he does a good job monitoring his crop, weed, and everything. You know, this guy may do a good job too, but he might just want to button his shirt. I don't know. Sometimes just wet, get on the plants and everything. Just, you know, do's and don'ts sometimes. <laughs> Harvest equipment. We've talked a little bit about that, about when to clean your equipment, the cleaning process, the sanitation, or just the cleaning. But remove, the main thing is you want to remove any remnants of a prior crop for no cross contamination. That's one of the big issues, cross-contamination in many steps of the process. If you use the same equipment for harvesting, the same equipment for washing, the same equipment for drying, like Janine was showing, you want to wash between crops completely. And then when you get it to a further step up, if you're going to a cut and sift where you're going to cut the material through a machine, those machines, when they change product, they have to take them all completely apart to make sure they're in all the cracks and crevices and clean those out too. So. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it has to be done. This is just some shots of a, uh, this is a modified or an improved potato harvester. It's used to harvest golden seal. This is just from the driver's point of view, where it goes in the ground and scoops it up and begins a process of agitation. This is, these are three different grades or spaces of agitation belts on there. You can see them here. This is a, big, a smaller one and a larger one. And then eventually the roots will fall off on the ground here in the back. This is golden seal coming off. But it really starts out with a potato digger. And that's one thing. When I talk to growers who want to get into medicinal herb farming, it's really not, Janine and I have said this a lot of times, don't quit your day job it's, unless you really got some good money to back you up because it's a good supplemental income, but you don't want to go out and buy all new equipment either. For example, if you're a potato grower and you already harvested an underground crop, You've got that equipment, then consider growing underground crops. If you're something that harvests is strictly above ground, soybeans or corn, then think of growing a, a cell, growing a crop that's going to be above ground. Adapt it to what you already know and what your equipment is already set up for. Good collection. Again, permits and permission for legal acquisition, specifically with wildcraft, and that's very important because more and more, they want to know where it is. For, for example, a ginseng buyer, any of y'all harvest ginseng, wild ginseng? If you get it off somebody else's land, it's not your own land, you need to have permission for the land. And the buyer is now asking where these came from, and he uh, may want to ask for a copy of your permission slip if you did not dig it on your land to keep that. Identification, again, sustainable. Janine talked about that. She's exactly right that none of these plants, to my knowledge, have a uh, <clears throat> manual on how much to harvest, when to harvest, and it, all, it depends on the species, the regeneration process, what kind of propagator it is naturally, so you just gotta keep an eye on it. <coughs> why, is it why do ginseng buyers not require uh, <clears throat> the same documentation that like you do for herbs? Like for instance, oh, well, you, you can walk in with a backpack full of ginseng and mm -hmm. buy right out of the backpack. They'll buy it out, but they, uh, they're they required to, this, ginseng is a site listed plant, like Janine mentioned, an international endangered species, and they have to record certain things, but states are different too, but they have to record who bought it. They have, in North Carolina, you gotta show your driver's license, record your address, a phone number, where you harvested and everything. So it's a little different. Ginseng is regulated. Do you lose your permit as a buyer if you don't do that? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Lose your life. It's all on the buyer at this point. Exactly. We're talking, uh, talking about putting permits on the harvesters, mm -hmm. but right now it's all on that buyer. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is just to pay a, pay a little respect to a gentleman who taught me a majority of what I knew. I grew up in my grand grandfather's nursery business, and Mr. Gibson was one of the foremans there. And again, just like it says, he could barely speak his, or spell his name 
and only a third grade education, but he could pronounce these sanguinary canadensis, polygonum, all of these botanical names, and he knew how to propagate them growing. I remember when I was young, there would be professors coming there. They'd come in in their coats and ties and their manuals and sit down, and he'd be sitting there chewing tobacco in this outfit that he wore daily and answering these plant questions because he had done it all his life. So I just think we need the traditional knowledge, particularly here in the Appalachian Mountains, where a lot of families have stayed and they've thrived and they've lived on these herbs. It's knowledge that is very worthy to be documented and it is our history. So, Again, going back to when to harvest the plant and the different qualities and everything, each and every plant, this is specifically for grains, but each and every plant has, has a specific time where it takes up certain nutrients. Uh, some of them are very mobile, some of them are slightly mobile within the vascular system of the plant. But if they grow this enough and they do enough research on it, the growers or the buyers, they know this, so just work with them on that. Again, this is where we were working with this customer who was looking specifically for, uh, this customer was looking for caftaric acid. The other customer wanted chicoric acid. They're both a constituent in echinacea purpurea. And we learned that about 40% 40, 40 full bloom, right before it starts to cone, is a cone flower, they call it, when they're still somewhat immature blooms is when the caftaric acid is at the highest level. So we harvested. As soon as I took this photo, I stepped aside and the harvester went through and cut this. So there are specific stages of plants uh, growth to harvest. Is there a generic on that where on plants that bloom, most of them are higher right before they finish their bloom process? Well, it all depends on the constituent, but generally speaking, they're right when they start to bloom, a lot of those constituents change, and then when they go into seed production, senescence, they start to change. So there's really, in my observation, there's really three main stages, the pre-bloom, the bloom stage, and the seed stage. But all the constituents are contained, it just depends on which, which constituent and which species it is. This is, a, this is kind of a unique setup here. This is where we're growing Echinacea angustifolia in Chile. And what was unique about this is, which I have to yet to see it happen this cooperatively here in the United States. It even happens in Canada. I can give a grower in Canada a contract to grow something, and he can go to his federal land bank or some of the banks here, and they may lend him money to get started. In the U.S. here, it's really hard. You, you may go through grants and things. But this is a process in Chile where uh, this is a pharmacist. This lady here was a pharmacist, and she they, were, they settled as, in a pharmacy down there. Anyway, we knew a specific constituent we were looking for in Echinacea. We had a university that said, I'll help the grower. Uh, if he wants to grow it, he can sit it into our lab and I'll do the testing. The pharmacist would tell them what this constituent is they're looking for. And then the buyer, I mean the, uh, the, grant, the government uh, agency said, well, then we can fund this and we can help him because it is funding agriculture. So we were out there in the field and they all shook hands and said, well, I'll cooperate and get this grower a finished product. But you don't see that happen often. But it worked well, but that's the kind of collaboration you really need between the grower, the buyer, and some way to test it. Either the grower's going to test it, I mean the, the buyer's going to test it, or a lab's going to work with you, just to know what you have. And like I said, there are optimum, optimal excuse me, harvest conditions. It should be used in consumer for optimum times. Work with your buyer on that, conditions. Uh, producers must also take factors into account when planning the raw material production. Producers are more and more starting to pay attention to the raw material because they're seeing shortages. Sometimes years ago when there weren't that many uh, being sold or not more people producing, the shortages were not there and they would just buy because the product was sitting on their market. Now the market is a little tighter, there's a lot more people, so the buyers are paying more attention to when the material is available, which is good. Again, by learning the optimum time to harvest, we learned that uh, golden seal, this is harvesting golden seal. We started at 4 a.m., we even put lights on the, on the harvester, and we stopped about 10 because we realized that the sun, when the sun started coming through the shade structure, it caused the golden seal to oxidize some of the berberine and hydrastine. Before, we were harvesting all day, and it'd sit out in the sun, and we were getting low levels. So we started harvesting early, and we also left the shade cloth that for prior to this, we would take the shade cloth, this is retractable shade, we would take the shade cloth down, then harvest, and as soon as the sun starts hitting that uh, fresh plant on the ground, it starts degrading and you lose constituents. 
just by virtue of this, we did some tests. This was in a test that we were comparing wildcrafted uh, golden seal to cultivated golden seal. And the two constituents were the uh, hydrastine and berberine. And basically overall, uh, the total alkaloids together combined in cultivated was a little bit higher than the wild. So we were trying to prove that cultivated material could be as strong, or in this case, stronger than wildcrafted, because a lot of people said, oh no, wildcrafted is always better. And that's not always true, but again, uh, there were some cultural things we did in the growing, but in my opinion, the majority of it is post-harvest handling, which is so important, <clears throat> which we'll talk about a little more. Again, these are some of the main things during post-harvest handling. <coughs> it's really critical during, the immediate, during and immediately after harvest what you do to your plant. Do you let it lay out in the sun? Do you let it degradate? Do you say, well, I'm too tired today. I'm not going to be able to wash it and start drying it. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. It's really important. You've got to be prepared for that. Like Janine said, uh, was it Janine? I believe you said when they harvested a whole acre and they couldn't fit it in that barn to dry it, then what's happened? It starts breaking down when they're driving around trying to find somewhere to dry it. So you've got to be prepared. Your equipment, your washing, any special preparation for that particular crop that you're harvesting. Are you going to cut it and mill it prior to drying or after drying? Just need to be prepared and your storage. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, documentation. We are the first link in the chain of custody. And chain of custody, again, with the New York Attorney General talking about proper plant ID, the customer wants to see a chain of custody. They want to know where it started, how do you know that the seed, seed source was proper. Harvested the crop on ID, you know, when and where it was collected, if it was wildcrafted, what stage of growth did you harvest it? Some of the specification sheets I sell to customers, they want to know exactly what the temperature was that day, how much humidity was there, was the sun shining, was it cloudy? They know, well, it just depends. Permission. Again, this is that golden seal harvest when we're picking up the plants before the sun starts to get into it and putting it in a container. Uh, a few other things, the timing, uh, temperature and moisture. Janine talked a, bit, a little bit about that in the drying aspect. The fact that you have a dehumidifier in your dryer, that really helps. That really helps. I remember we were in, uh, in Dominica and they had basically to dry some of their herbs. They just had a small shipping container like you mentioned. And it was so hot down there already, they didn't even have to heat it, but they did have a dehumidifier in their container. That's all they used to just take the humidity out. Yes, Janine. Something I forgot to mention. Could you talk about getting the herbs to the proper moisture and keep mm -hmm. maintaining that? What happens when you don't? Know? Generally speaking, uh, you've got to get below, and I'm not a lab or a science guy, but if anybody is, please speak up. But I know, generally speaking, to prevent any microbial activity, you have to get below at least 12%. A maximum of 12. You have to be below 12 percent. Yes. Dr. Rushing. Jim. Mm -hmm. Said 14 percent in the food safety class. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. Uh, 14 percent. And most of most of the specs on herbs are 12 percent or below. Some of them are 8 to 10 percent. And that is uh, you have to get your herbs dry. If you're going to a dry state of herbs, you know. You, and the main thing. I would say if you're just going to lay some herbs out, if you're drying cohosh roots, for example, you've got some really big roots and some really small roots. Test your big roots. If you get your big roots dry, you know your, your small ones are dry, okay? But if you test your small ones, they're dry. The big ones may not be dry in the middle, and they're going to start de I mean, decomposing from the inside out. And mold, once mold gets started, you've got to forget about it. You've got to get it out. Yes, please. Let me support your statement because I just realized the difference when we're drying the rams, mm -hmm. we're drying them. He wanted us to bring the temperature up at a, to 150 degrees for two hours to start and off. drop it down exactly. to kill the bacteria. Then we could use the water activity at 14% at the end point. But if you're using a lower temperature than 150 degrees on your dehydrating or drying process right. for fresh herbs, you need uh, a lower water activity. So I'm supporting your 12 to 8 percent water activity. Thank you. Well, Thank then you've got to be really careful with drying roots. If you start with the temperature too high, it dries the surface, right. and then your center never dries. Right. So you've got to be really careful on that. 
So you can move the temperature up over time. Right. And a lot of people ruin their ginseng right. by drying it, trying to dry it too quickly, and then the interior is ruined. It gets this funky, glassy color to it, and no value. And air circulation, no matter what you do, the more air circulation is better? Yes. Look, you all probably know that, but we notice a real, a huge difference depending on the weather. Oh, yeah. And we, on dry days, can dry in 16 to 24 hours. Right. And on wet days, sometimes it'll take three or four days. Oh, yeah, exactly. The outside humidity is a big factor because you're bringing that air through there. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We use a crunch test because we don't have the capacity. <clears throat> and he showed us how to do that, is that we, we literally take the plant and crunch it in our hand and it should just fall apart. Yep. And if it doesn't do that, it's not dry. Yep. We use the pencil test for a root. If it snaps like a pencil, it's dry. Right. I mean, then you, your you're customer's gonna test that most likely get his lab analysis to make sure it's But dry. I urge you to learn. So we're growing <coughs> hops also, which is also a medicinal herb. And almost every one of us, the first couple years we grow hops, when we send our samples in for analysis, our hops are too wet. We think they're dry. Yep. They feel dry, <coughs> but they're not. And I gave you a link in that paper to what you really need to do a time or two is really learn what 10% feels like yep. on your product. Yes. And there is an oven drying method. It's the way they do grain testing. Yep. Or a microwave method, which is closer. Basically, what you do is get, take something, weigh it out, get it to crispy critter stage, and then you can take your product and weigh it at different stages of dryness. And you can feel what a 20% and a 10% moisture feels like. <clears throat> and then you've got to keep it there. Because yep. you and I were both involved in a project where our grower grew a great herb, yep. dried it beautifully, but then many of these herbs absorb moisture quick, very quickly back from the atmosphere. So then you've got to store it right. Yeah, depending on the density of the product, a root crop doesn't absorb it back as much as an aerial crop, an herb crop, but they do absorb them back to different degrees. So. And again, record keeping. And you know, record keeping is not only for the benefit of the sale and what you need to do, but also, uh, if there's a mistake, that's what great could keep you for. You can go back and see what happened. Why is this product good and this one bad? And if it's a good reason, for example, we had a, one of our crops of Echinacea purpurea we grew in California. Uh, the, this customer was allowing us to field dry it, so we cut it. At the time, we dried it on plastic. We let it dry one day, and then we'd flip it. Well, it was doing okay, but then we had a crop we cut and it drizzled that day and it rained on it. So we were ready to throw the crop away, but we pulled a sample. We sent it in the customer. They sent, they called us back and said, we want 10 tons of this. This was great. And we never did figure out what it did, but somehow the moisture on the cut, already cut crop increased one of the constituents they were looking for. But anyway, at least we were able to go back to our records and follow the lot number. We signed the lot number and we were able to trace back. What did we do different in this one compared to these other six that made this one good. And we said, sorry, we can't, that was a free grain in California. We can't do that. So anyway, it was interesting just to know that. And it was strictly about record keeping. Uh, water quality, we've already talked about water quality, facility design. Here's the main thing I want to focus here. here uh, removal of foreign organic matter, foreign material. There's always going to be, we've got every, buyer has, and I remember uh, Jackie, when she was a guy, she had a whole box of things that would come in raw materials, belt buckles, bullets, <laughs> I mean, cigarette lighters, always rock stones, and foreign organic matters, not belt buckles and uh, uh, bullets. That's more like sticks, stones, and things like that, foreign organic, but you would not believe what, I mean, bolts off from cultivation, you think, well, that's clean, bolts off tractors and equipment like that. Yes? Well, I'm washing, uh, Echinacea root. I try not to wash it too much, but I want sure. to get it clean enough <clears throat> for my for my buyer. And it does this wonderful. It's almost like fermentation. These bubbles start coming out. And I keep wondering if I'm losing. Am I losing something there? Well, it depends on the constituents, whether water soluble, alcohol soluble, obviously. But for example, our golden seal. We used to <coughs> dip our golden seal and leave it in the bath and agitate it. 
but we, whenever we pour the water out, we see the yellow water, yeah. so the reverberate was being decreased. So we went to a quick uh, three second stir instead of a three minute uh, soak. So obviously if it's a water soluble constituent, the more you leave it in the water, the more it starts pulling it out. And that is a very fine line on what does it take to get it clean as opposed to what does it take to start degrading the product. So it really depends on the product and everything. But if you see discoloration in the water, yeah, you know you're losing some. And, and really, the, I just want it clean as possible. I would first of all suggest not, don't submerse it, okay? The least submersion of anything because then that's really getting all the plant. Just some spray and some agitation, whatever it takes to get it clean. But again, it's going to depend on the plant and the constituent. And how much of it goes on the soil type, too? Uh, the soil type as far as washing? Being able to get it clean. Quickly. The soil type? Oh, by all means. I know as some growers have good sandy soil, and they wait on a decent dry day to harvest. They just harvest and shake it off, and it's pretty clean. Really clean. And then the same crop grown in another climate, number one, it doesn't matter if it's wet or dry, it's going to stick to it. They're going to have to wash it. So, yeah, picking your soil climates and what can do makes a big difference. Uh, and again, uh, where are you going to wash it? This is a, a, a food grade facility that we lease to wash some of our golden seal. This is a Teflon, a food Teflon grade belt and a stainless steel washer. So we facilitated that to wash our golden seal. Or are you going to wash it out back on your aluminum uh, roofing with your wife's favorite lawn furniture? <laughs> and of course your... There you go. And of course your brand new trash can from Walmart. Are you going to put it in there to wash it? But you know, again, just be attentive to what you're doing. And a lot of this, a lot of what we're saying is really common sense. I remember always trying to tell my growers, say, look, think about it like you're going to, whatever you're doing there, you're going to put it in your mouth. Or you're going to put it in a child's mouth. Because eventually it's going to be consumed by someone. So just try to pay attention to that. Uh, dehydration, we've talked a little bit about that. The timing, the temperature is very important. Are you going to cut it first? Like for example, some root crops, the big ones, you may want to cut them so it dries well into the center. Like uh, we were talking about potpourri earlier, you may want to do that in sunlight or shade. Certain crops can tolerate. They do a lot of the maca drying in, in uh, South America in the sun, and it is allowed. It's okay if it's controlled. Uh, here we utilized uh, a lot of, like, again, we couldn't go out and build these dryers just for echinacea purpurea. But this was in California where they dried grapes to make raisins. So this is the off season for them. They weren't ready to harvest grapes. So we just utilize their uh, the material we come in here and it go in this rack, highly automized. Go up here and it go in these uh, carts and these carts were on rail tracks. And then we go over here and roll these into a dryer. And these are tunnels. These are uh, indirect heat tunnels where the heat goes out up here. And it's like two tractor and trailers stacked on top. The heat goes in, it comes out here and goes out over the product and dries in second nation. And then you just close the doors and actually halfway through the process, we would roll these carts out and uh, turn them on these turnstiles so we would reverse the heat impact where it was affecting them. But anyway, we were trying to utilize what was already there. Yes, ma'am. So what you're saying is halfway through the drying process, they would take them out and restack them? No, we wouldn't restack them. It's just they were on racks and the heat was all hitting this side. Right. We just spin them around, around so the heat would hit way. the other side. Because... because a little bit of the, the direct heat on that side is obviously hotter than the app. Right, and then the heat at the top is going to be different from the heat at exactly. the bottom. Exactly. In, in a different environment, good air circulation would take care of the problem. You're right. You're right. It would have. But they, well, they had high fans. It was just the direction. It flowed through. It was all one direction. Okay. So at a facility like that, I live in an area that has a lot of peanuts. Okay. There's a okay. lot of peanuts grown in my area of Florida. So if I could find a peanut, how... Now this is, you said this was used to dry grapes, yes. into raisins. How did you clean those racks? Did you purchase those racks new? Did you clean no, them we, before? No, we cleaned like, them, sanitized them okay. completely. Yeah. So that would be this, acceptable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it was a food wow. grape ciliate and they knew exactly because they actually dried some other thing. And then when it went to, uh, well, wine's different, but anyway, they were doing different uh, types of grapes. They had to clean in between each different species too. Wow. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you know what kind of wood they used in the rack? Um, no, I do not. Can you find out? Uh, well, and I'm not sure that the wood, you know, what we would need to find out right. is would this wood 
be acceptable down the road. Yeah, this is 1995 or six, so down the road it may not They're be. They're going away from the wood on a lot. Yeah, of they are. They're going away the from wood. The reason people are having to go away from wood. Yeah. I can't hear you. We're having to go away from wood, he said. Yeah, this was 1996, so things have changed and they're going to change drastically faster now, for sure. Uh, air circulation, we've talked about, driving with artificial heat, record keeping. I can't stress that enough. I'll show you a little bit about record. When do you assign a lot number? Jenny asked me to specify that. Really, uh, number one, you need to start keeping records. I mean, if we get a crop, if we get a lot of seeds, a lot of seed, if we get a, a pound of seeds, then I need to, I want to document where that seed came from. And basically my lot number is going to be able to trace it all the way back to that, uh, where I got the seed. Here's one thing you don't want to do, probably. You don't want to go out and pack your golden seal. This is many, many years ago out in front of Wilcox Natural Products trying to beat it up and break it up to get the nerd off. You probably don't want to do that. More something like this, where Janine was talking about metal and things in crops. This was actually going across a uh, earth magnet, a very strong magnet. It was pulling out any metals, nails, anything metal coming out of there. Uh, packaging and storage. Again, record keeping. Make sure what you're packaging in is something that is not, if it has been previously used, make it's been sure it's thoroughly clean. Make sure it's, uh, you know, record keeping right down. May we see your records? That's the next thing the customer may say. You've got to have those records to show them the buyer. The more records you have, the more comfortable they're going to be with you. Uh, for example, this, you know, these guys brought this in, the cherry bark and burlap sacks, or is it the willow? Well, you know, they may not remember. I don't think this is going to be GMP compliant here, particularly in today's environment. Yeah, they, some of these are maybe they're, uh, I, I mean, I've seen them bring in things in sheets, pillowcases, you know, just whatever they had. And it wasn't so long ago that no. that's what it no. all No, this was, the, this was the no. mid-90s. This was the, this, they thought this was great, you know, as long as they brought it in there, but this wouldn't work today's market. This would, proper storage, everything's segregated, uh, packed in either polypropylene bags, Gaylords, or even in drums, and separated. Each of these already have a lot number assigned to them, so we know what they are in storage. Uh, shipping containers, carriers. Also, when, you, when you're shipping something classification, most of my customers require all of our products now to be shipped as a food grade product, which means that they would be separate from any contaminants, possible contaminants to contaminate the product. So you just have to specify that on your shipping with the trucking company. Here's a mistake. You don't want to load a little more than your proper transportation can handle here. You don't want to get a little carried away. You know, just a little bit overload. I guess I got one more box of that, it'll be okay. So consider your transportation. Uh, labels and lot numbers. Again, all packages have to be, and I've got an example of this next, but at the least minimum you need to have your common and Latin binomial, the plant part, the form of the material, cut, you know, hole, the owner of the material, and the weights, the customers required. This is minimal requirements. Oftentimes the lot number is also just to escape that. And I'll show you an example of our uh, <coughs> yeah, this is an example for several different herbs here I wanted to show you. This is just a, a label that we adhere to, any labels that go on our packaging. You can see the weights are different. The weights may vary from crop to crop, how much you can get in the bag or how much the customer is buying. But here you've got our name, <coughs> you've got the Latin name, the form of the product. We don't have the common name on this. We always supply that with the other label. Here's our lot number. And from these lot numbers that I'm familiar with and we've developed, I know, if I could pull out my code, I know what this is, is the crop, I know the source of the material, the grower, or the wild crafter, I know the date it was either harvested or dried, and I know if it's wild crafted uh, or certified organic. I know this particular is a, a fringe tree, but it's root bark. This particular customer wanted root bark. This white pine is just bark. In Lespedeza, this is herb. Uh, for example, ginseng, this was wild harvested herb, and this is uh, certified organic milk thistle seeds. So anyway, you just need to have a process for your lot number. There's not a federally mandated lot number set up, it's just whatever your lot number is, you have to have traceability to that. Yes, ma'am? Okay, go back to so we've got wild crafters, <clears throat> multiple wild crafters, and you're buying from wild crafters
do you assign part of your lock code each wildcraft or individual yes. Yes. has a yes. component of the code that goes directly to them exactly then you don't mix you you've got all these ginseng roots in right. from different growers mm -hmm. do you mix them together i mean if and how do you keep track of that do you mix them together yeah. Ideally, you don't, particularly if it's cultivated things. You'd rather, most growers would say, I'd rather want something from one farm. But if you only grow 200 pounds on this farm and they want 500 pounds, then obviously you're going to have to blend it. Yes, you're going to have to mix it. And uh, put, put I, both codes on I've it? got a whole other complicated spreadsheet that <laughs> I have a whole spreadsheet that's got everybody. If I have a lot, I have everybody that's included in that lot. Yes. So. But if the grower kept kept a sample of what they sold, you'd be able to track. If there was a problem, you'd be able to. Uh, exactly, you go back to the grower. Back. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if ideally, you know, I can say this batch consists of five different lots, and I have all control of that. But like again, if you only have if you only have ten pounds, ten pounds, and ten pounds, and the customer wants thirty pounds, if he's going to buy thirty pounds, those lots need to be mixed. Now they need to be uh, homogeneous as possible. For example, the same, obviously the same plant and everything, but to some degree, it's some portion down the road, they are, they are going to be mixed together, but you still have to have a lot number that traces back to individual batches. What kind of a uh, number are you requiring your wildcrafter, records of your wildcrafter? What do you mean, what kind of a number? I mean, are, you know, like the uh, one guy I sell, sell to, I have to, uh, I keep a sample. Right. You know, right. of, it, of everything, right. like what you're talking about. I don't have to do the press and all that. Right. Like that sample. Right. And I have to Retention sample. Yes. 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 And I have to let him know where it came from, but yep. not, not GPS. Like no, said. no, no, no. I just have this come from this region or right. this region. That's all I have to do. That's, and that's right. Okay. That's exactly right. Two things. Size <clears throat> sample are you receiving? And um, the second thing, there was a list that kind of has a rap sheet, recommended your alpha numeric, you're creating a lot number. Do you mind going back to that? Uh, okay, I'll go back first. I know it's not perfect, but it is a no, good okay. starting point. First question, generally speaking, the retention sample should be at least 200 grams. Okay. Because for a lab analysis, they, they require a minimum of 200 grams. Amanda, do you have something to add to that? Amount for a lab analysis? Amanda, 200 grams is usually fine to do a pretty big unit test. Yeah. I just have a little tough work in time. That's it. <laughs> 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 That's right. It's just not that much. That's what it is. And I will say, again. And I vacuum seal it. Actually. Well, again, once it gets further up the supply chain, they're a lot more specific. In other words, when it goes into manufacturing, mm -hmm. they are very regulated on how much they have to retain and everything. Okay. But from a, from a raw material point of view, we maintain a minimum of 200 grams for five years. Okay. Now you want me to go back a couple of slides. You tell me when to stop. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's some of the basics. That's really what you need to have. And under the OPA GACPs, under 3.8.3, it talks a little bit more about a uh, lot number. Basically, it's got to be something to identify traceability through the supply chain and customer. That's really all it is. Traceability. Let me just make from our own record keeping procedures. Yes. What really is critical is the lot number provides a link between the product you ship and gives you a, a, a route back to where it was grown, yes. how it was propagated, who that's handled it. it in propagation, and where the seeds came from. That's all it, that's it. That's and it, 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 it's a linchpin. That's it. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've got, I'm trying to figure out if, the manufacturer then, how they incorporate your lot number into the manufactured finished product. Once, once they receive it, that's recorded, but then they assign a whole new lot number. Right. They'll assign their own lot number. And they may buy from five different people that same product to make their full batch. If they have to do a thousand pound batch run, they may have to buy from different people, but then they will assign at the next step of the level process and they assign their lot number. But then say there's a problem, okay? Yep. They accumulated yep. it from these five and their product goes out.
and something goes wrong, there's some contaminant, they find a heavy metal, they should be able to come back then to those five people they bought from, and it should be able to trace back to all. And then they start testing. They'll probably, instead of testing all, they would probably go, okay, that material that came from this part of West Virginia might be the one most likely, and they'll start down that way, and hopefully until they find it. And they might not. They might never track it down, but it often can help. And that's why some of the wild harvesters I know actually use a GPS component <coughs> to be able to know I've harvested from you. You know, because they go all over the place. Yeah. But well, again, some of us wild don't want anybody to know where we went to. Well, they don't tell. They don't necessarily yeah. tell. They've got that information. Yeah. So on their lot number, he was ever to come back and go, we hit heavy metal on this, don't go that, back there. that that yeah. grower or that harvester then goes, that sense. oh, yeah, that came sense. off this and part I'm, of that mountain. Right. I'm Patricia, I'm you had some, doing that yeah. <laughs> she might be able to add something as a manufacturer. Manufacturer, when we get it in, we have a batch number that those plants go into, but the plants, we have retention samples of it, plus we send all that raw material out yep. for heavy metal testing yep. and for our bacterial and microbes. So we know before we even put it into yeah. medicine whether or not it's good or not. Yep. And so that's, and the whole purpose is to be able to track it back. And you'll have a whole new lot number on it at that yeah. point. Yeah, and we're bringing stuff from out of the country. I know for our raw food uh, product that we just made, we have a contract manufacturer doing that, but all of that testing was supposed to be doing in the other countries, but then it stopped at the border and re repeated. Right. Then when it gets to the contract manufacturer, <coughs> they have to do it. Yeah. And we have to retain all along the way um, samples in case it has to be retested for anything. Yep. Okay, let me we've got the last few slides here I want to get through. Record keeping again, five years complete chain of custody retention samples. Three years, but we actually keep ours a minimum of five. I believe it's three years after the shelf life of the product mm -hmm. is what's required. Trouble is, I don't know who I sell it to, what their shelf life is, so we just keep ours at least five years. Okay. Uh, again, the customer may say, hmm, we need to see your samples and the accompanying records, so you need to have those available, available to show them. I'm going to go through a few just basic documents. This is just a certificate of authenticity, real basic, botanical name, common name, whether it's cultivated, wildcrafted, what plant part there is, uh, country of origin, very important. We even keep up with the seasonal harvest. A lot of people don't require that, but I like to keep that as record. The stage of plant growth, was it pre-bloom, bloom, post-bloom, post dormant? And then that's where the lot number is assigned to it. Um, and then again, some of the basic quality specifications, moisture we've talked about, ash, basically dirt, AIA, that's acid and soluble ash, foreign organic matter, active constituents, a lot of customers do have constituents they're testing for specifically extract customers, and or no thank you, we compost. In other words, if you don't have that or it doesn't meet all of these specs, it's just compost in some instances. More documentation, this is a, <laughs> this is a raw material spec sheet for golden seal, so you can see how specific it gets. Again, microbial, physical analysis, the three basics, and then chemical. This is a whole pesticide uh, residual screen like Amanda's lab can do and she's done for us in the past. And again, heavy metals. Now, they're, they're here at this time, this is fairly old. There were only three, now the big five heavy metals are the main ones. And again, this is another spec sheet from a different customer on purple rear root. Some of the basics, uh, physical profile, product profile, additional testing, pesticide, heavy metals, lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury. And I want to make a point on the heavy metals. That isn't just in cultivated. No. Oh, no. And that's a matter of fact, some of our tests that we did on blood root, where we got the arsenic, was the stuff that came out of the woods. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I mean, I mean it's they're naturally, naturally, they're naturally <laughs> occurring. They're not mm -hmm. just induced by our admissions, although they're increased. There's not much indifferent on this one. Again, properly applied GACPs, in my opinion, equal quality natural products. And it starts with us, one of the most important factors is a quality natural product based on the mess is the quality of the raw material. We know that. I believe the general public knows that, but I believe we need to focus on that more. So this is what I feel like is our duty and obligation to provide, uh, follow good agricultural collection practices to provide the best food, supplement, whatever it is that's going into the food chain that we can do. So 
Let's just end on a little bit of humor here, a little bit of... Does anybody get this? I saw this <laughs> sign. Also. I don't know if this is... Uh, they made them change their sign to truth in advertising or just to live out or anything. Full transparency. Yeah, full transparency. Who knows? But anyway, and then the next one, this guy really wanted to get his drugs. He was in a rush. You know, you've seen the drive through but he didn't, he didn't know the sign that said Dory on back. So. That's a big one right, Ed. This just showed up. I don't know. Yeah, he, he really took it as a drive through pharmacy here. He said, I won't buy now. And here's one thing we want to stay away from. This is a from on front of Organic Gardening magazine years ago, but you definitely don't want to end up with this. And they just talk about, you know, make this the brave new technology a bad, bad bet. It sure does look like it here. This is a, a display booth at Expo West a few years ago. I thought it was great. Just a really good, I can't remember, it might have been uh, Marlboro Organics, but anyway, it was really good. I thought it was a really good display of what multiple benefits of organic agriculture can do. And then this is just um, one of our farm in California where we grew Echinacea purpurea, so I'll end with that. And I do have some samples to pull out if we have time just to stir around and I'll show you some of them and answer some more questions like that. How's that? Good, that's great.